Welcome back to Calculus 2. This is part two of our lecture on volume by slicing, where we'll introduce the disc and washer methods. All right, in part one, we had our general formula for volume, where we take a three-dimensional object, a solid, and split it, partition it, into a bunch of thin cross sections. Now we'll still be doing the same thing here, but these are going to be special types of solids called solids of revolution. And what we do is take a region in the XY plane, typically for this simple uh, kind of approach, we'll have a region bounded above by a curve and then usually below by the X axis. We'll rotate that region around the X axis. And the thought is you can see as we rotate this uh, kind of region, it'll generate and sweep out a three-dimensional solid. All right, so we're gonna apply our slicing method to this. We're gonna have to kind of slice this solid into thin cross sections. The benefit of the rotation, we're rotating a, a region around the x-axis, due to the rotation, our cross sections are going to be circular. And circles have very simple area formulas. So here we kind of drew a sketch. Notice with the curve, I'm only drawing the upper part. Due to rotating around the x-axis, that kind of a red cross section where the height is labeled as f of x, as you rotate that around the x-axis, that distance acts as a radius. So the conceptual kind of, kind of key here is that the radius of one of these cross sections, and again, the cross-sectional areas here are going to be circular due to rotation, the radius is given by the function value. We basically just take a look at the area of one of these uh, circular cross sections. It's going to be of the form pi r squared, where r is the radius. Now the radius is given by the function value. So we pick an x value, make a slice there, the distance from the x-axis to the curve that is the radius of one of these cross sections. So the cross sectional area here for a solid of revolution is very simple. A of x equals pi times the function of x squared. And that's basically it. This is a very simple formula. This is a uh, method known as the disk method since we're slicing the solid into a bunch of thin disks. All right, now the questions here are actually simple. Uh, you're gonna be given the kind of usually the upper boundary curve, f of x, and this is a simple plug and chug formula. There's really no work in deriving the area as a function of x like the previous examples. We basically just plug it in here. So let's go ahead and take a look at example three. Before we do that, let's take a look at the related method known as the washer method. Now this is a little more complicated. You have to kind of uh, imagine what's going on due to rotation there. Now, instead of rotating a region bounded by a single curve, we might have a region bounded by two curves. So the region of interest here would be bounded above by f of x and below by g of x. Now, since we're staying between those curves, there's gonna be a gap or hole when we rotate beneath the graph of g of x going down to the x-axis. That's what gives us a washer. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Hopefully for that uh, kind of a set of functions, this three-dimensional sketch is decent. So I tried to draw it with a uh, kind of a uh, kind of a transparent view so you can see the relevant curves relating to the functions, f of x and g of x. All right, now in this perspective, you can see if you rotate that region, it'll kind of give you a solid revolution on the outside. But on the inside, due to there being a uh, kind of a lack of a region from g of x down to the x-axis, that gives us the hole. So if we take a look at one of our cross sections there, it's gonna come out not to be a solid disk, but there's a hole the hole goes from g of x down to the x-axis. Now let's take a look at how we'll figure out that area. It's actually really simple. 
we're going to think of the uh, kind of face-on view of a washer, washer as a circle with a circular area taken out of it. So we basically just apply the area formula for a circle, pi r squared, where we have the uh, kind of radius for the whole, we're going to call that r inner, and then we have the outer radius going to the edge of the solid with the cross section. We'll denote that as r outer. So we basically subtract out the area of the whole. So we subtract out pi times r inner squared. And we get our cross sectional area here. We're going to write it generally as pi times the uh, uh, outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. I like this version since it doesn't reference f of x and g of x. We're going to interpret r outer and r inner as functions of x. So here in our sketch, just so you see, going from the axis of rotation, which is the x-axis right now, as we go kind of up to the inner part of that washer, that distance for r inner would be exactly the function value given by g of x. So g of x represents the inner radius, and then the outer radius, r outer, is given by f of x. All right, and this is called the washer method, since the cross sections here are no longer solid disks, but washers. There's a uh, kind of a hole in the middle. So it's the same idea. We basically have the volume for one of these washers, and then we add up, integrate all those washers over the extent of the object from A to B. So we have this version here, two of them. We have it as the volume for the washer method, uh, the uh, integral from A to B of pi, and the pi is there due to the area of a circle. And then we have it as f of x squared minus g of x squared. That notation, you have to be comfortable knowing f of x is the upper boundary curve of that region. G of x is the lower boundary curve of that region. I like the more general version on the bottom there, the integral of pi times the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, where r outer and r inner are both functions of x. Okay, so we have the disk method where the cross sections are solid disks. And then we now have the similar washer method. Both of those are used to find volumes for solids of revolution. Let's go ahead and apply this to a straightforward example three. Here's a summary first, just in case you want to copy this down before all the following examples. Here's the very brief outline. Pause the video if you need to write it down. And let's go ahead to example three. So example three is pretty straightforward. It's as close to the ideal problem you would hope for in, in calculus or a science course, a plug and chug problem. There's a formula the disk method, and we have a function given here, the boundary curve is bounded above by the graph of y equals e to the x. So pause the video and give this an attempt. This one should be straightforward. Now there is a common error, which we'll point out, but let's see if you uh, can make an attempt first, and then I'll point out what that common error is after a few minutes. All right, let's go through example three. So when, uh, when, when relevant, try to draw a sketch. Here the graph and sketch is very simple. Hopefully you're familiar with the graph of exponential functions. And the volume formula for the disk method, we integrate pi times the boundary function squared. Since the area of a circular cross section is pi times r squared. All right, so here the common error it's not in evaluating the integral, but it's actually just in some basic operations, basically squaring the exponential function. And just be careful. Notice you have an outer power 2, an inner power x. We multiply. 
So e to the x squared is the same as e raised to the 2x. Be careful, the common error I get is e to the x squared comes out to be e raised to the x squared, which is not the case. So just be careful. This actually gives us a much simpler integral because e to the 2x has an antiderivative. e to the x squared doesn't have an antiderivative. So if you made the common mistake, you would have had an impossible integral. Fortunately here, this one is quite possible and doable. All right, so we just have to integrate uh, the, uh, the cross section pi times e to the 2x. Now this should go really quick. You can do this with a substitution u equals 2x, but this was one of our shortcut formulas for what we call the one over a shortcut. We have an exponential function, which has a simple antiderivative itself. We have a linear expression of the form ax plus b inside. Here, a is played by the role of that factor of two in front of x. And we should expect from a u substitution, the shortcut, once we have a identified, the antiderivative has a one over a factor. So our antiderivative for e to the 2x is 1 half e to the 2x. Again, carrying out a u substitution in detail will lead you to this, but that shortcut probably speeds it up considerably. All right, at that point, we just need to plug in 0 and plug in 2. And you can simplify, factor out the pi over 2. Plugging in x is 2, you get an e to the fourth term. And when you plug in 0, um, I checked with my calculator earlier, e to the 0 is still 1. So you get as your answer here, pi over 2 times e to the fourth minus 1. That's your exact value for this volume. All right, now this was pretty straightforward. Um, if there was an, an error anywhere, it was either in squaring e to the x or maybe just taking longer than needed or you would have liked for uh, evaluating the integral, perhaps going through a u substitution in detail. But that should be pretty straightforward. All right, let's take a look at a good question. This is one where um, I think uh, you've known the answer for a while. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And then you basically have just been told it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Why is that 4 thirds there? Well, as it turns out, we now have all the tools to answer that. It's not made up. If you answer this question, which I'd like you to make an attempt at, you'll see where the four-thirds comes from. Mathematics, nobody makes it up. It's derived from very simple starting places. Here, we're going to derive this volume formula by using the disk method. Pause the video, and we'll check in in a few minutes. All right, let's take a look at some visualizations first. Maybe this will be enough to get you uh, through it if you were stuck. Now, how we're going to generate a sphere is we're going to rotate. We'll go with the upper half of a circle. As you rotate that around the x-axis, that generates and sweeps out a sphere. So here, we have it as the general formula coming from uh, the equation of a circle of radius r. Solve it for y you get the equation for the upper half or upper hemisphere. So we have as our function, which we can basically plug into the volume formula for the disk method, we have the f of x as the square root of r squared minus x squared. We have an interval, since it's the um, uh, radius r, it's not a uh, kind of a, a numerical value, but it is a fixed constant radius r, the interval we go from basically cross sections all the way to the left at x equals negative r to summing or adding all the cross sections up to x equals positive r. So our interval that we'll integrate over 
is negative r to r. All right, in case you got stuck setting up the volume integral, here it is. Be careful, the uh, kind of function is a square root, but the volume formula for the disk method is pi times the function squared. So here, maybe pause the video, give yourself a minute or so to evaluate this. We'll check in in about a minute. You should, at the end of this, get 4 thirds pi r cubed. You might see within a few moments where that 4 thirds comes from. All right, welcome back. Let's point out the moment of truth where that four thirds comes from. Notice in the integral, we have an x squared term. What's the antiderivative for x squared? One third x cubed. That's where basically the four thirds comes from. Now you have to keep in mind here that the radius little r is a constant. And there's a, a kind of common mistake made when evaluating this antiderivative. Now we're gonna use our even uh, function property uh, for integrals. The function r squared minus x squared is an even function, and the interval from negative r to positive r is symmetric. So just to make the calculation easy, let's double the uh, integral from zero to r. If we go through that, be careful, when you integrate term by term for what's in the parentheses, little r is a constant. You don't apply the power rule to that. We are integrating with respect to x. x is the variable. Little r is a fixed constant, the radius of the sphere. So when you integrate over on the left there, r squared with respect to x, the antiderivative is r squared x, the constant times x. It's not one third r cubed. So just be careful with that. That's likely where uh, kind of the, uh, that's the standard or common mistake is made for students I, uh, that I see in the, uh, the calc sequence. And if you integrate the other term, x squared, you get one third x cubed. If you plug in your limits, zero and r, within the value for x, the value when x is zero kills off that whole term. And then you are left with, when you plug in x equals little r, r cubed minus one third r cubed. So you see where the r cubed comes from. And as well as the one third, in parentheses, you have one minus a third, which is two thirds. And if you put that all together, like magic, we get our volume, which is not made up. We derived it here as four thirds pi r cubed. All right, this, in my opinion, is a uh, kind of very beautiful application of calculus. The calculation isn't that complicated, and it leads to a very important result. All right, let's continue to uh, some other ideas. So far, we've been talking for every example dealing with um, at least solids or revolution in this lecture, this part, rotating around the x-axis, which is y equals zero. Now, it is possible that we can rotate a region around some other line parallel to the x-axis. We're gonna take a look at that in example five, but before we do so, let's point out the correct perspective, in my opinion, that'll hopefully make you successful with example five. It's gonna involve the washer method. Don't use the formula for the washer method, the integral of pi times f of x squared minus g of x squared. I find students struggle with that version. It's not at all apparent what f of x and g of x are. Now the version I prefer, which is exactly bringing us to now, for example five, is this. Think of the volume formula for the washer method as the integral from a to b of pi times the outer radius squared 
minus the inner radius squared. Now, when you apply this, the radii, R outer and R inner, they refer to and are measured from the axis of rotation. It could be y equals zero, the x-axis, or some other parallel line. With that in mind, maybe pause the video, copy this down. Let's take a look at a final example five that's gonna involve the washer method and rotating a region around some line other than y equals zero. All right, now this one, I'd like you to make an attempt at. We took our time with some previous examples. Everything's been building. Let's see if you can use that tip that you measure R outer and R inner from the axis of rotation here for example five. Now this is a two-part example. We have a region bounded by the graphs of functions y equals nine minus x squared, y equals 12, x equals zero and x equals three. X equals zero and x equals three are the vertical lines on the side. They bounded uh, kind of uh, on the sides. Y equals nine minus x squared and y equals 12 bound it perhaps from above and below. Now for part A, we're rotating around the line y equals 12, which is one of the boundary curves. For part B, you shift that axis of rotation and you're rotating it around the line y equals 15, which is not one of our boundary curves. So I'd like you to make an attempt at this, pause the video, start by visualizing this region and then where the axis of rotation fits into this. See if you can determine relative to your axis of rotation if there would be a solid region or if your region due to rotation leaves a hole. We'll check in in a few minutes. All right, let's take a look at a sketch first for part A. So hopefully the curves here are rather simple. Nine minus X squared is a kind of a flipped parabola shifted up nine units. And then Y equals 12 is the equation for a uh, horizontal line. All right, so this is a visualization of our sketch. These curves bound the region so the region goes from y equals 12 down to the bottom boundary curve, y equals nine minus x squared. All right, we are rotating that region around the line y equals 12. And you can see your region goes right up to the axis of rotation. The region has no hole in it, which means we can apply the disk method here. Now this is a little tricky, not as tricky as part B, to determine basically the radius of one of your cross sections. So here, I drew it from the axis of rotation down to the reflected parabola. And due to rotation, that distance, little r, acts as the radius. Now our goal is we wanna find that distance, r, in terms of x. Now I like to do this just by adding the upper function, y equals 12, that's the distance from that horizontal line all the way down to the x-axis. Well, we have another function, the parabola, that tells you the distance from the parabola down to the x-axis. That distance is nine minus x squared. We can add nine minus x squared and little r, that should give you that total distance, 12 units, which is the distance to the upper curve. So here we can solve that for little r. Recall our radii and distances are all determined relative to our axis of rotation, which here is the line y equals 12. And we get as our radius or function of x, x squared plus three. The three is 12 minus nine. All right, at this point, we can tackle the problem. 
we have our basic error distance, and we can plug that into our volume formula. Recall your formula is pi times the radius squared, where now the radius is given by x squared plus three. The evaluation here is probably the hardest part since you have to deal with uh, powers of three and gets a little messy. Give yourself a few seconds, at least see if you can evaluate the antiderivative up to plugging in. All right, hopefully this goes pretty quick. Notice here, we only need to apply the power rule, correctly foil everything out first. And if you apply the power rule, your antiderivative should be one fifth x to the fifth plus two x cubed plus nine x. And then we evaluate that using the fundamental theorem of calculus from zero to three. Now, if you wanna get a kind of a, uh, an aesthetically pleasing answer, combine all those fractions together using common denominators of five, and you can write this whole result as 648 fifths times pi. All right, now that does it for part A. With that sketch maybe, maybe that'll be enough to get you through part B. If you need to, pause the video again, see if you can make a, an, a, an attempt with this uh, work for part B. We'll check in in maybe about a minute, in case you haven't uh, kind of finished or attempted it yet. All right, let's go through part B. Here, the only addition to the previous sketch is the line of, which is acting as the axis of rotation, y equals 15. Now, hopefully here, you can see where your region is. Your region, bounded by the given curves, goes from the horizontal line, y equals 12, down to the parabola. As you rotate that region, you can see from the edge y equals 12 up to the axis of rotation, there's no region that serves as forming the hole when you rotate around the line y equals 15. Since there's a hole, that's why we're gonna use the washer method. Now this sketch, if you weren't able to draw it, should probably make you successful with the work that we did for example one. Notice I drew our outer and our inner relative to that axis of rotation. See if you can apply a similar argument to how we determined little r in part a and apply those ideas here. We'll check in in about a minute to complete the problem. All right, let's go through the work in determining our outer and our inner as functions of x. We're gonna again try to use the addition argument individually to determine our inner and our outer. Now the total distance from the x-axis to the axis of rotation is 15 units. But individually, we can say that that comes out to be our inner plus 12, should equal 15. And if you solve that, you get our inner as just three. That's probably easy to see. Notice going from the axis of rotation to the edge from y equals 15 to y, y equals 12, that's three units. All right, the outer radius is probably a little more complicated. The total distance from the uh, x-axis to the axis of rotation is 15 units, but we're gonna think of our outer, now going from the axis of rotation to the parabola, 
we can add our outer plus the function value nine minus x squared, that should equal 15. And if you solve that for our outer, we get that it comes out to x squared plus six. All right, that is probably the tricky part, determining our outer and our inner relative to your axis of rotation. Here, the axis of rotation was no longer the x-axis, y equals zero, but a parallel line. All right, with this, we can complete the problem. We can apply the volume formula, the integral from A to B, here from zero to three, of pi times the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. And again, since our outer and our inner are at most simple quadratic polynomials, we can expand everything and get an, a, a function to integrate as a bunch of powers of x and apply the power rule. If you do that here, apply the power rule to find the antiderivative, we can plug in zero and three and then subtract. A Little more tedious than uh, part A to get this precise value, 1,188 fifths times pi, but usually getting up to there, the step of uh, plugging in your antiderivative, that's kind of most of the way through the question.